So I'm going to talk about what's got, and this tube has got quite a long history, magnetic anomaly detection. And all this arises from the Earth's magnetic field, which is, you know, we, we can't change. Uh, it's unfortunate that the physicists have, physicists have given the unit of magnetic field a rather large size. It's huge. So um, the Earth's magnetic field is only a tiny fraction, less than 100, 10 thousandth of a Tesla. But Tesla is what the standard unit is. So it's a smallish field that the Earth has, but it's important. And it's important because long-standing issue for navies, ship's hulls become magnetized and, I th and therefore susceptible to magnetic mines. And that problem, I think maybe our Navy colleague can tell me, it certainly was there in World War II, may have even been there in World War I, I'm not sure, but it's a long history. So what happens is that ship hulls are routinely degaussed. That's a big big important thing for, for neighbours. Um, so important is that they won't let the public know how effective it is. Um, no idea whether they get rid of 90%, 99%, 99.9%. Who knows? But um, to get some gauge for what might, what might happen and what one might be able to find in the way of a stray magnetic field around a submarine, I've just guessed that a submarine's about 10,000 tons. Well, that's in the open literature. That's all right. But let's suppose that the degaussers, the demagnetizers, have been very successful, and they've got rid of 99.9% .9 of the magnetism. I have no idea whether that's anywhere near correct. But let's suppose that's what they do. So it's pretty effective. So you go looking for the magnetic field from a submarine, or ship any, in general, but from a submarine. And there are lots of different kinds of, of magnetometers around, many developed with input from particularly US Navy labs. Um, and I've got, my, I've got my tape, my standard measure, my guinea pig measure of sensitivity of a, of a, um, of a magnetometer, something that measures magnetic fields, is a Woolworth magnet. I know Woolworths long since disappeared, but imagine in your childhood you went to buy a magnet from Woolworths, OK? So these kinds of magnetometers would detect a Woolworths magnet at about 10 meters. You can get atomic, you can have atomic magnetometers. It would be rather better, go to 100 meters. But the devices I'm going to talk about are based on superconducting materials, materials that conduct electricity without any dissipation. And they're quantum, superconducting quantum interference devices. And they'll detect, if you took the Woolworths bar magnet on the other side of the Thames and walked along the embankment, the Albert embankment there, you'd just about be able to pick that up with a squid magnetometer. So here's what you might be trying to do with a submarine. There's, I've put that plot of magnetic field against distance, and there's the squid. What, it, that, what the squid detector does, it has a big a, a loop, which might be small, might be big, of superconducting wire, wire that carries electricity without any dissipation, then it goes into the device itself. And that's picking up like a fishing net. It's picking up, picking up the magnetic field lines that emanate from the magnetized object. Now, the difficulty is that any magnet, the field drops off as the cube of the distance, the inverse cube of the distance. So you go 10 times further away, and you're a 1,000 times weaker field. So it drops off very fast indeed. So the anomaly from a submarine, my fictitious submarine, would drop to the level of the Earth's field 100 meters away. But you'll get to the limit of sensitivity of the squid maybe 30 kilometers away. So that's sounding a bit more useful. But you've still got a vast ocean and of course, it's not a nice, uniform, steady magnetic field. You have got both spatial and temporal variations, which are enormous compared to the sensitivity of the squid. So you have a challenge. How do you find the needle, the, the submarine? Well, you use lots and lots of sensors arrayed together to do noise cancelling, cancel this, cancel that. You do clever electronics. 
even more, you do, if you know what kind of thing you're looking for, that makes the task much easier, you look for a signature. And that you increasingly can do more easily because you've got the good software. And uh, let me just say, an example I've given here is, as you know, the brain, when active, has electric currents in it. There's a magnetic field associated with those, with, uh, those brain currents, particularly if you have epilepsy and have an epileptic attack. There's quite strong currents. This is being used, this, is, this squid detectors are being used in, uh, to look at brain activity using the magnetic field generated in the brain. And those fields are tiny, tiny, much harder to look for than e electroencephalograms, magnetoencephalograms, real hard task to do, but people are doing it. Now, we're trying to look forward, unpredictabilities. Let me, of, of itself, superconductivity is an extraordinary phenomenon. Unpredicted, made no link to conventional physics 100 years ago. Nobody could understand where it came from. Um, eventually, 50 years later, it was understood and um, the, the um, th good theory said that you have to be very quite close to absolute zero. You have to cool the superconductors down to, well, with liquid helium, down to close to absolute zero, which, of course, makes it complicated and expensive. The theory said the maximum temperature you'd ever get to with a superconductor was 30 Kelvin, but unpredictable 1986 discovery of new kinds of materials that are still superconducting Still cold compared to room temperature, but at the temperature of liquid nitrogen that you see sloshing around the street, or go gets uh, trucked around the streets in big tanks. Okay? So that, big, that technology, cooling technology, is much cheaper and more readily available. So that technology is kind of in the process of becoming more pervasive. Now, question for the future. Will there be room temperature superconductors? Uh, who knows? Who knows? But, I mean, were there to be, they could well equate to higher sensitivity detectors and more particularly cheaper and more pervasive technologies. It would be much cheaper to, to um, make devices. So the futures. Even now, the Navy labs, I'm sure, certainly in the U.S., are able to implement bespoke submarine detectors that will be responsive, to, particularly responsive to the kind of signals submarines will give. So that will give some advant advantage. Data fusion, which somebody mentioned it a little bit earlier, and David's going to, going to be talking about weight detection in a minute. So combining signals from various, various, various sources and getting the, getting the software to do it. Data fusion with other sources, signal sources, acoustic or whatever. So, and of course, the big, the big thing might be room temperature superconductors. So, it's a very cloudy, not even translucent scene, I'm afraid. Um, I wish I had a better crystal ball, I haven't. But I mean, there's a lot of question marks. Thank you. <laughs>